It's just great to, it's great to celebrate and to, to be filled with the, the joy that comes with that. Hey, before we open up our Bibles, I just uh, did want to remind you that as we come into our Christmas season and as we've been doing this series on Vintage Christmas, one of the traditions that we have here at Cold Springs Church is our Christmas giving project. And uh, every year uh, we strive to be extraordinarily generous, recognizing that God has been extraordinarily generous to us in his son Jesus. And as God gave um, freely to us, um, we want to give freely into our world and our community. And so through the, through the years, we've partnered with different ministries internationally and locally in order to show the, the grace and the love of Jesus in the world. And this year, we're continuing that tradition. And our Christmas giving project um, is centered on helping with uh, victims of the campfire. And it is partnering with those families in Megalia, Paradise, and all of that area who are in a long and challenging um, journey of recovery. And we've partnered with the North Valley Community Foundation, which has been there for a long time and and is going to be there for a long time, who's connected with all the different service organizations and the needs that are going on in the community in order to be able to um, be with them for the longer haul. And our goal is to to raise $20,000, and we've reached uh, $5,500 so far. We really are excited about the generosity that people are expressing, and we just encourage you to pray um, how God might have you be a part of that. And just a reminder that 100% of that goes, um, none of it stays here, none of it's a part of of what we do here, but it goes out into um, our community to be a blessing, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so uh, we do that through the month of December, give opportunities to give. There's the opportunities to give that are up on the screen. You can text you can go online to our website, coldspringschurch.net, or the app that we have. If you haven't downloaded our app, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, and there's the giving kiosks that are out in the lobby. You can write a check. You can put cash in the envelope that's there in the chair in front of you. Any of that is a way that you can um, practice that generosity and be a part of the giving project. So let's pray together this morning. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for uh, being able to be led in worship by um, your children and to be encouraged in, uh, by their joy um, that we might experience and find joy in our lives as well. And Lord, this morning as we open up uh, your word, I pray that we would have eyes and ears and minds and hearts to see and to receive all that you have for us this morning. Um, And that we would be blessed and we would see that blessing. We would embrace it this morning and this day. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. At the beginning of December, we began this series called Vintage Christmas. And really the the idea behind Vintage Christmas is is that we would be able to to capture again uh, what was the essence and the meaning of Christmas as it was really God intended it for, a, for us to experience. And that in, in looking at some key words of hope and of joy, of love and of peace, and those are in Christmas cards, they're in Christmas lights, they're things that we can say to each other, but what is it that God is wanting to communicate to us? What is he wanting us to understand about those things? as we come into and celebrate the gift of Jesus into the world. And this morning, we're looking at this idea of joy. Has anybody here ever struggled with uh, finding joy in your life at all? Has that ever been a challenge or experience? Okay, you can stay. Everybody else, you can leave. You've got it all down, all right? Oh, actually, you might want to stay because then you can share with somebody else who struggles with that. Um, Joy, for me, has been one of those elusive things. I think throughout my life, it's a thing that's like, how do I experience more joy? And so it's been, uh, it's been good for me in this process of looking more deeply at what the Bible has to say and what this story about, about Jesus coming into the earth has to say about joy, because joy is a central idea of the gift of Jesus to us that we celebrate at Christmas. And I want us to look at a story that's found in the Bible as we, we dive into this word of joy, of this idea of joy this morning. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it up to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to be. And this is Luke's telling of the, of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. And he's telling of a particular interaction that happens of where the divine comes and meets the ordinary of life. 
In Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, is where um, these angelic beings come and they visit this group of shepherds and let them know what's going on and what God is up to. And so let's read that story in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger, and suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Now, if you take a moment to think about this story, there's a lot of sort of ordinary that happens with these moments of extraordinary taking place. And the, the, the ordinary is, is it, um, has anybody here ever been a shepherd? All right. Okay. My, my grandfather was a shepherd for, for a while. Um, in growing up, bless you, in growing up, I, um, I worked on ranches, and so I was around sheep and around cows and, and that type of thing a, a lot. And, but if you think about the life of a shepherd, the life of the shepherd could be defined as extraordinary amounts of ordinary, of, of, of very mundane life and day-to-day existence. Because here's the job description of a shepherd. Make sure the sheep are fed and watered and nothing kills it. All right, that, that's your job description. So it's like, you know, make sure, wander around with the sheep, get it, you know, move them from pasture to pasture because sheep will just eat, you know, they'll, they'll eat things down to the dirt and then start eating the dirt. So you have to, you know, sort of, they're not the smartest animals on the universe, in the universe. So you have to keep moving them and you have to make sure that they have water. And so you take them to water and then occasionally there are these moments of extreme adrenaline where a mountain lion or a bear or something like shows up and wants to eat what you are in charge of taking care of. And then, you know, you know, game on. But until then, there's no smartphone. You're not sitting on a rock checking Facebook and going, hey, Facebook, sheep, you know, Instagram, sheep. Hey, there's another sheep. Dang, there's a bear, bear. You know, there's, there's nothing like that. It's like, you know, not checking your social media. You're not Snapchatting with anybody. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're sitting on a rock looking at sheep. Every day. And at night, the sheep are all sort of together, and you're sort of listening and wanting to make sure that there's nothing sneaking up. Every day, every night, there's a lot of mundane. That was the life of the shepherd. And the life of the shepherd, you know, as well, was it was not necessarily seen as an honorable position. You were sort of the lowest of the social spectrum within the culture of the day. It wasn't a high calling that people sought after. And so, you know, as a shepherd, you're like, you know, well, what do I do? You know, I can't, you know, do anything. So I'll just, I'll get ready for those moments when something shows up to do, like a mountain lion or a bear. And and you get a little bit of a picture of this with David, if you're familiar with David's story in the Old Testament, because King David was shepherd boy David. He was the youngest. He was sent out with the, sh- the family sheep to, to watch over the sheep. And so what David did is, is that David practiced target practice, right? With a sling. You know, I wonder if I can hit that rock. I wonder if I can hit that tree. 
I wonder if I can hit that sheep. <laughs> he was a boy. You know he did it, right? He, it's like they didn't hit him in the head. He hit him in the rear end when there's lots of wool on him. They didn't feel a thing. But he was a boy. He did it. You know, he's like, I'm going to practice on the sheep. I wonder how, what, that, what they'll do. <laughs> oh, they run. I don't want that. So that's what the shepherd, life of the shepherd was. And so here, this one night, all of a sudden, in the midst of the ordinary mundane of life, the extraordinary shows up. The angels come. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary, right? I mean, if you're just in the midst of a mundane life, and angels show up, and then angels that are singing show up, all around you. I mean, that's a pretty extraordinary experience that is happening, and that's the story. The extraordinary invades the ordinary, and when we experience the extraordinary is the invitation to see and to, and to experience joy in life. And so you have the ordinary of these shepherds and the extraordinary of the angels. You have the ordinary of great fear is their response to something different, right? And that's pretty ordinary for us, right? How many, how many times do we come up against things that we don't expect or, or that we know and our response is to be fearful? It's the ordinary. And then the extraordinary of great joy overcomes these shepherds. The ordinary of a baby. I mean, babies are born all the time. And, and, and we know the Christmas story of that, you know, there wasn't a place in the, in the, in the house of the inn in order for, for Mary to have her baby. And she probably didn't want to be in there anyway because it wasn't like everybody had separate rooms. It was like people in a, in a, a room to, together. So she's out in a, a stable in a barn in a cave but there were lots of babies who were born like that. I mean, you even read stories, you know, occasionally pop up of the woman, there's a woman who gave birth in a, in a coffee shop here recently, I think, you know, by herself because no, there was no help. Or there was a woman that was, that was familiar with in, in Ethiopia that she didn't make it to the hospital that she had the baby in the middle of the street. The baby's just like, okay, here I am. I'm, 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 I'm here. Ordinary. But the extraordinary is, is that this was Savior. The ordinary happening, the extraordinary coming and meeting in the ordinary. And in the extraordinary happening in the midst of the ordinary, there is the opportunity for joy. So what, so what is joy? Well, when we look at joy from the perspective of the Bible, there's a couple of aspects of joy. One is, is that joy is a feeling. Joy is the emotional response that we experience. It's the positive response of something good happening. That, that, that there's something extraordinary, good that, that takes place. And so we have an emotional reaction, emotional response to that. Look at verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. When the, the shepherds are there with Mary and Joseph and the baby, and there's obviously other people around, and they're telling the story of what happened to them. And the people wondered. There's a sense of wonder of joy that is there. You see in, in verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And Mary w was still figuring out the story. I mean, she had had an angel visit her earlier, so she knew sort of what was up, what was going on. She, but, but here, now the angels have visited the shepherds. The shepherds are telling more of the story of what's going on, and she's capturing all of that. She's holding on to it. And then in verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Glorifying and praising God. I mean, that, that is, that is the, the expression, the picture of, of joy that they were, they were experiencing. But when we think about our life, when we think about joy, here's, here's the rub. It's that it's a risk to feel joy. It's a risk to feel joy. I was reading a book by Brene Brown who does a lot of research on um, fear and shame and vulnerability. And 
in, in her book, Dare to Lead, this is, this is what she says about joy. She says, why do we insist on dress rehearsing tragedy in moments of deep joy? Let me stop there for a second. What she reflects on is, is that what, when something good happens in our life, that the vast majority of us, what we do is, is that we experience that good, but then we almost immediately start going worst case scenario. Oh, this is a, this is a, this is a, a meaningful relationship that I'm having. Oh, they're probably crazy. <laughs> oh, look at this. This is, a, this is a beautiful baby. I wonder what decisions they're going to make when they're teenagers. I hope I'm not a lousy parent. Oh, man, I got this promotion. This is fantastic. Oh, I need to work harder in order to prove that I'm worth this promotion. Why do we insist on dress rehearsing tragedy in moments of deep joy, Brene Brown says. She continues, because joy is the most vulnerable emotion we feel. And that's saying something given that I study fear and shame. And I remember when I read this, I was like, wow, that's, that's an important insight. Because again, I shared with you, I mean, joy can be some, one of the things that's been elusive for me. And, but if you put it in this thing, it's because joy is the most vulnerable emotion that we feel. When we feel joy, it is a place of incredible vulnerability. It's beauty and fragility and deep gratitude and impermanence all wrapped up in one experience. When we can't tolerate that level of vulnerability, joy actually becomes foreboding, and we immediately move to self-protection. It's as if we grab vulnerability by the shoulders and say, you will not catch me off guard. You will not sucker punch me with pain. I will be prepared and ready for you. So when something joyful happens, we start planning on being hurt. We start planning to deal with the fear of disappointment. Is this helpful? Of course not. We cannot plan for painful moments. We know this for a fact because people who have been forced to live through those moments tell us that there's no amount of catastrophizing or planning for disaster that prepares you for them. The collateral damage of this instinct is that we squander the joy we need to build up an emotional reserve, the joy that allows us to build up resilience for when tragic things do happen. Joy is a feeling but it's an extraordinarily vulnerable place to be. That here is this beautiful thing. This is, here is this wonderful, extraordinary thing that has happened. This extraordinary that has come into my ordinary, into my mundane. And here's my opportunity just to emotionally be in this moment and to be there. And so many of us aren't willing to go there. We aren't willing to sit with that feeling. Now, here's the other thing. When you look at the Bible, is, is that joy isn't simply an emotional response to the good in life. It's not just a feeling that we have, but joy is also an action. Joy is the choice of gratitude regardless of the circumstance. This is one of the things the Bible teaches us. So, James, in his book, and James is sort of the New Testament's wisdom book, it's sort of the New Testament book of Proverbs, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, this is what James says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, hold on to that, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Whoa, hold on, wait a minute. Joy, trials, those are not together, right? You know, it's like either one or the other. You can't put those two together. What is going on here? You either have joy or you have pain. You have joy or you have struggles. You have joy or you have challenges. But James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, when you think about it from what James is saying, saying, okay, joy is this action, it's this choice that we have in the circumstances where we find ourselves, no matter what they are, and that they're intimately tied with what we've already talked about of 
hope and peace. We're hope, we have hope because we know that we're a part of a larger story and that whatever is going on in our life, that God is the king, he's the Lord over that story, over my story. And my story is a part of a bigger story that God is a part of. And he is king over it. He, nothing is catching him by surprise. And so I can have hope. And then peace... Peace is not the absence of challenges in our life. It's the presence of Jesus in whatever challenges, whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And so that's when we come to this whole thing of joy, where James says, count it all joy, my brothers. He's reminding us that there's a choice that is connected into this greater thing that God is doing in our lives and in the world so how do, we, how do we do that? What does that look like? Well, let's continue to see what, see what Brene Brown says about this very interestingly. And she says, what is the one thing that people who can fully lean into joy have in common? Gratitude. They practice gratitude. Now, think about this for a second. Okay, that... The idea of gratitude is something that was revealed over 2,000 years ago. You cannot help, if you are reading your Bible carefully, to see that God is constantly saying, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. And so here, research has shown the Bible actually knows what it's talking about. Imagine that. What's the one thing that people who can fully lean into joy have in common? Gratitude. They practice gratitude. It's not an attitude of gratitude. It's an actual practice. They keep a journal or make a note of what they're grateful for on their phones or share it with family members. Embodying and practicing gratitude changes everything. It is not a personal construct. It's a human construct, a unifying part of our existence. And it's the antidote to foreboding joy, plain and simple. It's allowing yourself the pleasure of accomplishment or love or joy, of really feeling it, of basking in it, by conjuring up gratitude for the moment and for the opportunity. It's gratitude. So when James says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face various trials, He's reminding us of this, is that no matter what we're going through, no matter the challenges or the difficulties or the pain that we find ourselves in, and, and please know I do not minimize the challenges, difficulties, or the pain that you are experiencing in your life right now, but I also know this, is, is that the graces of God are greater than what you're experiencing. And that if we will open up our eyes, if we, will, if we will begin to look and we will begin to see, no matter what it is that we are experiencing, that his grace is showing up in an even greater way. And it's in that we can experience gratitude of seeing his grace. Joy will be experienced when we feel it and when we choose it. And gratitude is the practice of joy. Has anybody here ever done a sport? Ever done a sport? Um, when you first started that sport, were you lousy at it? Yes, you were. Everybody is. doesn't matter. It's like it, there is nobody who ever did a sport who said, I'm just going to show up on game day and do my thing. And it's going to be, you know, I am all-star, you know, award-winning. No, it isn't. Everybody who starts a sport... What they have to do is they have to practice. And you look at even the best athletes, the best athletes are the ones who have practiced the most and continue to realize, I need to practice. There are parts of my game that need to come up to another level, and the only way that I'm going to get there is, is that if I practice the right thing. Because then when it comes game time, those things are ingrained and I'll do the thing that I've practiced. You see, this is the, within the spiritual life, there are practices 
Traditionally, what they've been called is the spiritual disciplines, but they are the spiritual practices, the things that we practice in our life so that when things go sideways or things go hard, that there is a pattern of thinking, there's a pattern of living, there's a pattern of action in our lives that sustains us and and helps us to overcome and to be resilient. And if you want to experience joy, it is the practice of gratitude. Nobody does it perfect, but it's the thing that you practice, you intentionally do. So how do we embrace joy? How do we find and and experience this joy in our life? How can we do that? Let's look at some of the ways. The first thing is is that if we're going to embrace joy, we have to be able to see it. We have to be able to see the thing that brings joy. It's the practice of gratitude that I just talked about. So here's the question. What are you missing because you're not looking? What are you missing about God's graces showing up in your life, in the day-to-day things that are going on, in the mundane that you are experiencing because you're not taking the time to look for them? That you're not taking the time to see it? So just think about even this morning, up to this point, okay? It's 10-12, all right? Up to 10-12. Some of you have been awake for at least an hour, I think, right? Okay. So in the last hour, in the last two hours, what's something good that has happened to you so far today? What's something that's good? For some of you, are like, I woke up this morning. Yeah, all right. You know what? I have the chance for a new day. For me, it's like, man, I had a good cup of coffee this morning. I made a good coffee. It tasted really good. It was awesome. It was great. I got a new puppy. I got to play with my puppy this morning. It's like awesome. It's great. What goods happened to you today? Write it down. Celebrate it. Have you you taken the time to, to celebrate it? Because you've seen it. You can't celebrate that which you don't see. You can't feel that which you don't recognize. So see it. And then the other thing is to is to sit with it. That good thing, that grace, that blessing, that extraordinary that has met you in the midst of the ordinary, to sit with it, to be with it. Have you noticed how difficult it is to live in the present? Have you noticed how difficult it is to live in the present? I was sort of reflecting on this even as I was um, uh, doing some little videoing of the kids, right, of singing. Uh, And I was sending it to some friends who... um, couldn't be here, but the kid was here. And I was thinking, how oftentimes do we, are, we are so intent on recording the moment that we don't live the moment? Because a lot of times, we never go back and watch the video. We don't watch the video. And we've missed the moment because we were so intent on getting in the right place to get the video that we've never watched. It's difficult to be present in life. And so our personality and our experience sort of push us one of two directions. One of those directions is looking over our shoulder. We're the person who who is always looking for the other shoe to drop, right? It's like, okay... What, 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 what's, what's bad is going to happen? What's going what's to happen here? And it's looking in the past and living with either regret or projection. Regret is the life of living the what if life. What if I had, what if I had taken that other job? What if, what if I had married another person? What if I had made another choice? What if, and so we're, we're living in this, this life of regret. We can't live in the moment because we're regretting all the things in the past. Projection is living with the belief that the past will always have to be the present and the future. Well, this is what happened last time I did this, so obviously it's going to be what happens this time. And there's no sense that, that, that we have the ability to choose and that God has given us the power of choice in our lives, that things can be different. Now, it's important for us to be paying attention to the past and learn from the past. But God has given us this power through his spirit. The other thing is, is, is that 
so we can look over our shoulder as one way to live, and our personality and experience can push us that way. The other is, is that we can be a person who's always looking around the next corner, looking over the next horizon. This is living in what's next or what could be. You know, it's, it's what's, what's next. When we live in the what's next, it never allows us the time to celebrate or to grieve. This is, this is my challenge. It's like, okay, what's the next hill to climb? What's the next challenge? What's the next adventure to, to go after? Okay, we did that. You know, that's the old news. And, and never sort of taking the time and, and being in the moment and saying, hey, this is, this is an opportunity to celebrate. This is an opportunity to, to have a party. Living in the what could be um, keeps us from appreciating and learning from what was and, and what is. Do we get the moment robbed? And if we're going to experience joy, the only time we can experience joy is in the now, of what's going on now. So we have to sit with it. And then we have to quiet the doubt. What's the conversation going on in your head? You see, this is what Brene Brown says, is, you know, that 80 to 90% of us, when something good happens, there's this thing called stinking thinking immediately comes in. It's like, what, what bad, you know, what, what's the bad part of it? What's the bad angle? What's the, the thing that's missing instead of what is the, the blessing that has come and, and that we're experiencing, that stinking thinking. What is your stinking thinking? What's your internal conversation that's going on in your head? Here's what Paul writes to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. That sounds an awful lot like count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face various trials. quiet the doubt, and then to step into the risk. Clearly, to be a joyful person is to take a risk because it's the most vulnerable thing, place that we can be. To live a joyful life. So what would it look like for you to live joyfully? You, not somebody else, but you. You know, for some people, they're never going to dance, right? They're just, not, they're just not the dancing people. I remember I was this last week, I was at Eldorado High School and hanging out in the classrooms. Um, and uh, I, was, I was sitting there and I was watching this, this girl who was, um, she would get up from her seat to go to, I think it was just an experience or a, a, a reason for her to move. And she would come up to put something in the garbage can and she'd go, You know, everything was movement and flowing. I mean, she was a dancer. You could just sort of see it. It just flowed out of her. Me, as you saw, not so much, right? You know, I'm fortunate. I tried not to fall off the stage, and I succeeded. It was good. So what does it look like for you to live joyfully? Is it to smile more? Is it to laugh? Is it to hug? Is it to sing? Is it to dance? Is it to shout? Is it to appreciate? Is it to encourage? What does it for you look like for you to live in that moment, to embrace the vulnerability of joy, of the extraordinary entering into your ordinary, of the graces of God showing up? And embrace every opportunity to be joyful. I, I remember thinking about this, it's fairly recent, sort of like, man, you know, this is. I don't take enough time to celebrate. So, you know, I want to take those opportunities to celebrate, to be more intentional about celebrating. And I'm still lousy at it. But I'm thinking, okay, you know, yeah, every holiday is made up by the card industry in order, and the jewelry industry for you to spend money on their, their products. Uh, but, hey, you know what? It is a reminder, a great opportunity to, to celebrate. So I'm going to celebrate those things. I want to celebrate those things in a better way. I just won't buy cards or jewelry, you know, and support them, right? But I'll figure out another way to do that. Celebrate. Embrace every opportunity to be joyful. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. I think this Christmas is an opportunity for us to be more like Mary and more like the shepherds to recognize that there is joy. 
Are you going to practice gratitude to be able to embrace it? The joy is going to be experienced by, by feeling it and by choosing it. And we're going to experience that much more when we begin to practice gratitude. And then the joy. We'll, we'll, we'll see what's already there. And then we can be the people of Jesus in the world. We can be the people who, who the Prince of Peace has come. That there might be great joy in us and through us. And the world will be better. The kingdom will be stronger because we are living more like Jesus and the gift that he is to us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are joy and peace and life and love. A song that we, that we sang in worship this morning. And I pray that um, you would help us to begin to, to practice gratitude to practice having the eyes to see the greatness of your love and your peace and your hope and your joy and your life flowing towards us and that the world might see you in the name of jesus i pray amen